about that time again. Hi, Linda. Nice to see you on tonight. Hello, Heather. Haven't seen you in ages. Make sure that's not. Hi, Irene. I think by Scottish standards, it's been a blazing hot day today. Evening, Jim. Good to see you. It's a very Scottish greeting. Hiya. Hi, Muriel. Just about that time. Uh. Hope everyone's managed to have a good day and enjoyed the warmth and the sunshine. I think I read in the news, at least for the southern part of the UK, this was the hottest day on record for the year so far. So I think at Heathrow it was a boiling 33 some odd degrees. So that's really hot uh, by specifically UK standards. So nice to see everyone tonight. We're going to launch into it. Uh, we're going to be continuing our reflections on the Ten Commandments. You may know there's uh, two main recordings of the Ten Commandments uh, in Scripture, one in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, and the other one in the book of Deuteronomy, which is in the fifth chapter. So those are the two main expressions of these Ten Commandments. As we may have heard before, the, the fancy term for the Ten Commandments is the Decalogue. Decalogue. So if you want to impress your friends, you can use that term instead. So we'll read through, as been the habit the last few weeks, up, up through the commandment that we are considering tonight. So starting in Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. <clears throat> God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before or besides me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and who keep my commandments." You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold the one guiltless who takes the Lord's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day. Remember to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving to you. You shall not murder. So that's as far as we're going tonight with a consideration of the sixth commandment as we heard it just read aloud you shall not murder and a welcome of course to all who have joined us since the reading started as well so glad to have each and every one of you with us tonight so when we think about this commandment tonight and any of the commandments for that matter we can think back to what jesus himself said about the law, how he himself summed it all up. He summed it up in what is known as the greatest commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, with everything that you are, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And that's, according to Jesus, that's the whole of the law summed up in two major commands, love for God and love for others, right? And this point is echoed throughout the scriptures. For example, in Paul's letter to the Romans in the 13th chapter, he tells his, his listeners and his readers that those who love their neighbors have fulfilled the whole of the law. Right? <coughs> Excuse me. 
So, if we seek to love God with our whole being, if we seek to love God, first of all, that will be seen in the keeping of the first four commandments. <coughs> Excuse me. The first four commandments. Shall have no other gods before the Lord, no idols, don't take his name in vain, honor the Sabbath. If we seek to love our neighbors, this will be seen in keeping commandments 5 through 10. So if we ever feel the need to ask, how do I love others? What are the guidelines for loving others? What, what are some benchmarks? What are some signposts that, that I can use to find my way in my attempt to love other people? We can look back to commandments 5 through 10 for a great place to start. We recall tonight that the whole of the law, all of these commandments and everything else that's contained within the law, it can't be filled up or fulfilled by sheer human effort. It can only be fulfilled in love. That we almost, apart from the virtue of love, none of the commandments that God gives can be fulfilled. And we can only receive the love that we need to fulfill the commands from God. So apart from God, the human heart cannot love in this way, and thus we are in need of God's help. And it makes me think of something that John Wesley said, and I see my uh, Princeton roommate Jeff is watching, so he might enjoy this, but the idea, John Wesley's idea of being perfected in love, right? And that this is God's grace working through our lives, perfecting us in the art and the act of love to keep God's commandments, to live the way that God wants us to live. And there's never a moment of our lives when we are not in need of our Savior Jesus who can recreate the love of God in each of our lives. And so today, or tonight, we go on to the sixth commandment, which in my translation is four words in English, you shall not murder. Right. Now, on one very real level, it is sad, it's tragedy, that this commandment even has to be spoken out loud. Such a commandment as you shall not murder ought to be self-evident to us. It's just part of the intrinsic moral law, right? We should automatically understand the sacredness of another person's life. But of course, it would not take any of us any time at all to think of recent stories in the news, some very recent, which touch on the sheer tragedy of not keeping this commandment, right? And the truth that is proclaimed in this commandment, what it speaks out against, in my mind, in my view, seems to be at the root of many of the protests that are currently going on around the world right now, here in the UK and also in the USA, about the treatment of black people and of minority status. In these in UK and US and other countries, these protests are going on. And... <clears throat> The Sixth Commandment, I think, is a word of protest against the way things are in our world. The late Pope John Paul II once remarked that the Sixth Commandment, the one we're dealing with tonight, is God's way of protesting against a culture of death. Right? And I like that idea of this commandment, the Sixth Commandment, being an act of divine protest against the way things are in the world. And the other commandments are that as well, the commandment against idolatry, taking the Lord's name in vain, honoring the Sabbath. All these ways, all these commandments are God's way of speaking into our lives to show us the better way, the way of the Lord and how we are to live and conduct ourselves and to treat others. Right? And especially I think this commandment, the sixth commandment, is a divine protest against what Viktor Frankl uh, famously called man's inhumanity to man. You'll pardon the gender-exclusive language, but that's his quote but our inhumanity to each other as brothers and sisters. This commandment speaks against that. And this commandment is a call for each of us to bring our hearts back to God, back to the reality of the cross, where our 
human inhumanity is met fully in Jesus and is overcome and is healed. Right? And so, looking at the face value of this commandment, you shall not murder, the text, the text says. 99.9% .9 of people who are living now or who have ever lived will never commit the act of murder. It's the, uh, the very few who actually commit this crime, which is one of the reasons why it makes our news when it happens, because it's such a shocking, inhuman act, right? But is that all that this commandment is hitting at, is refrain from the act of taking the life of another human being? Is there any more to it? And I'm leading us in a direction where the answer is yes. <laughs> because we have this commandment in Exodus, we turn forward to the Gospels, to the Gospel of Matthew, and Jesus' inc incredible, remarkable Sermon on the Mount. If you've never taken the time to read through Matthew chapters 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount, I would encourage all of us to, to do so. It's, it's hard to put into words how powerful, how transformative these words can be. And in chapter 5, verses 21 through 26, our Lord says the following. And indulge me, I'll read it out loud. Jesus says, You have heard it was said to those of old, You shall not murder. Right? That's him referencing the commandment right there. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother or sister will be liable to the council. Whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire or to the judgment of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother or sister and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him or her to court, lest your accusers hand you over to the judge, the judge to the guard, and you be thrown away into prison. Very truly, I say to you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. So that's Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 26, our Lord's teaching about anger. And we see from this text that I just read aloud that he starts the basis of his teaching on anger is this commandment against murder. So there is a link between murder and anger, right? And these words of Jesus, they, they shouldn't make us feel comfortable. They should make us feel challenged and convicted. These words of the Lord expose the anger, I think, in each of our hearts because it's from the anger of the human heart that the act of murder arises. It's from the anger of the human heart that the act of murder arises, right? And thinking for a second about the scope of this commandment, and if that's true, that the anger of the human heart is that from which the act of murder arises, the implications for following this commandment, you shall not murder, are incredibly radical, incredibly transformative. How if we take this commandment seriously, if we take our Lord's words about anger seriously and the consequences of anger, how can we continue with business as usual in our world? How can we continue to act to, to justify acts of warfare? How, to be political for a second, how do we square this with continued practice in some parts of the world with the death penalty, with other forms of premature death as well? Well, we have to be careful what the text says in the book of Exodus, in Deuteronomy. The Hebrew word in commandment 6 for murder has a very specific meaning. It refers to the violent taking of another human life. The violent um, early ending, right? We as human beings should not take another person's life in violence and anger. And so from my standpoint, it, it seems very hard to justify acts of warfare and use of capital punishment in light of this kind of commandment. 
just my take on it. Because this commandment, in my reading, reveals the sanctity, and that's a fancy word for holiness or value. This commandment reveals the value of every human life, regardless of age, regardless of gender, regardless of religion, right? It's not just for devout followers, but this is a blanket prohibition against the act of murder. Because frankly, to, to take another human life is to destroy the work of God, because all of life, I think in the final assessment, is a gift. God did not have to create. God did not have to give life to any of us. All of it is a free act, a free, gracious act, a gift from God to us. And only God has the right to give life, and only God has the right to take it away. No human being has the authority to take the God-given life of another. And in the, the act of, of, of murder, there are two, I think, basic claims. The first claim is that the goal achieved by the act of murder, of taking a life, that goal is of greater value than the life taken. Right? For like protecting a secret or uh, whatever, right? That if we take someone's life, we decided that the reason for taking the life is more important than the life. There's no escaping that, I think. And the second claim is that the act is claiming that the goal achieved by the act of murder is of such value, this goal is so precious, that it justifies our taking the place of God and taking a life. Right? So in one sense, every act of murder or taking a life is not a human attempt to usurp God from his rightful place. Right? And we think back to the scriptures, to one of the famous stories from the books of Samuel, the story of David and Bathsheba, where David saw this woman bathing across the way in a neighboring house, and he was immediately smitten, and he arranged to have her husband Uriah murdered on the front, on the battlefield front, so he could take her as his own wife. And we know that the prophet Nathan came to King David and rebuked him, and exposed the sin of what, the many sins that he committed in that one act the sins of adultery the sins of murder the sin of lying uh, the sin of idolatry it, it was a horrendous thing that King David did and so we look at Psalm 51 which is the psalm that David composed after he was exposed by the prophet Nathan and in that psalm there's one remarkable line where he David is praying to God through his words he says against you and you alone have I sinned that's what King David says he certainly did wrong by Bathsheba. He certainly did wrong by Uriah, her husband. But by saying, against you, Lord, and you alone have I sinned, he was recognizing that the most fundamental offense was against God himself. That by everything that he did in that despicable act, he was trying to usurp God's rightful place of lordship. Right? So, so back to Jesus for a second now. One of the points that he's making, I think, in this teaching on anger, which is connected to the Sixth Commandment, is that acts like murder, which is an extreme act, they do not come out of nowhere. They are not unprompted. They emerge from our hearts. And if we take Jesus' word seriously, we all have to reckon with what is going on in our hearts. And in this teaching, Jesus is blunt and he is relentless. He's drawing out in his teaching from the Sermon on the Mount, the deeper intent of the Sixth Commandment. He's, he's rebuking behaviors such as anger, biting sarcasm, mockery of others, of other people who God has also created. Right? He is calling out personal assaults by us on other people's personhood. Right? There's an escalation in his teaching as well. First he talks about anger. Then he talks about these... Uh, casual remarks, then these very caustic, insulting remarks, right? And each of these levels is tied in with an escalation of forms of judgment. First, they'll be liable to, uh, to the council, he says, um, or liable to judgment, and then liable to the council, and then liable to the hell of fire, right? So the worse the anger gets, the more it burns within us, the more we are alienated from God, Okay. 
I want to say one thing as well, because I know in Scotland, where most of us are watching from, that it is a, <laughs> a, a sacred tradition almost to uh, insult our friends, right? to poke fun at the people with whom we are chums and pals. And I'm not convinced that that's the kind of behavior that Jesus had in mind in this teaching about anger and insulting people. Because it's one thing if you poke fun, in, in good fun, at your friends and make them laugh and it's part of a good ribbing. If people know you're kidding and they know that your mocking is a sign of affection and love, that's not what's in view here. He's talking about the actual insulting, the genuine attempt to harm and to hurt other people, to wound their sense of self, to diminish their sense of value. That's the kind of insulting and caustic remarks that Jesus is talking about here. So, of course, this kind of anger, this kind of mockery, these acts themselves are not murder. But they're saying, Jesus is saying that these are the things that lead to these ultimate acts of evil. And this kind of anger, if left unchecked in the human heart and the human mind, will eventually flow over into inhuman acts against other humans. So what do we do with the anger that we have in our hearts? What do we do with the hurts we have experienced or the hurts we have inflicted on others? Right? Well, first and foremost, we have a call in Scripture. We have to deal with it directly. We have to deal with it. There's no good stuffing it away, hiding it, pretending it doesn't exist. Right? We have to deal openly and honestly with people with whom we are angry or who are angry with us. Right? And it's amazing in this text from Matthew that Jesus makes it clear that we really cannot worship God, fully worship God in spirit and in truth until we deal with the anger that exists between us and fellow believers. We cannot fully worship God and also hold on to the anger and resentment in our hearts. We cannot have it both ways. Right? And so there's four quick steps that we can take to deal with the internal violence that we face. We all have to be honest with ourselves. We all, every single one of us, have to realize our own capacity for inhumanity. We all have to reckon with what are we carrying in our own hearts. It's our, collectively, our own failures to deal with our own inner anger, our own inner violence, that really makes this world such a violent place sometimes. So we have, to, we have to recognize this in ourselves. And that's hard. It's really hard to admit that. But it's important. We have to confess this inner anger, this inner inhumanity to God. And we have to ask God for strength and for forgiveness. We have to also forgive those who have inflicted inhuman acts upon us. If... And sometimes the things that happen to us in life are so heinous and so hard that we think to ourselves, we say to ourselves, I cannot find it in myself to forgive this person for what he or she has done. Right? Or maybe I can't forgive myself for what I have done. Right? And I would say to that, that's a very real feeling. It doesn't make us weak. But it's pointing us back to the greater truth is that we all need God's help to truly forgive others and to forgive ourselves. Right? It's not something that we can just conjure up inside ourselves, muster up our own strength and get on with it. But we need God's help to truly forgive, to forgive in a way that, that heals, that reconciles, that helps us to see the image of God in others, even in those who have hurt us. We need God's help to forgive in that way. We cannot do it on our own. There is nothing gained ultimately by holding on to anger and to bitterness. There's a famous quote um, from Nelson Mandela. I think he was in prison for a total of 27 years before he was released. And he had, he had a way with words. And he had this quote that goes something to the effect of, he knew he had to forgive because if he didn't forgive, that he'd be just as imprisoned after he left jail as he was while he was in jail. He understood that his anger and his rage that he rightly felt, perhaps, would be even an even worse prison for him than the metal bars that kept him locked in place for so many years. He knew he had to forgive. He knew he had to let go. 
So we need to forgive. And the last thing we need to try and do is to reach out and to try and try and reconcile with others who we have hurt or who have hurt us. We have a Christian duty to try. We have to lay aside our pride. We have to try to follow Christ's example. And there is a very real risk when we try to reconcile with others that we might receive more criticism when we do so. We might expose ourselves to uh, more ridicule or whatnot. And this can be extremely hard. But I would submit that even the attempt, a good-hearted, good-faith effort to reconcile with others, that can free us from the inhumanity of the, our own anger in our own hearts. All right? There's a passage in Romans 12 where Paul says, insofar as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. And I like that verse a lot because it's not saying the whole act of reconciliation is up to each of us. It's saying as insofar as it depends on your efforts to try to be at peace with all. If other people don't respond in kind, that's on them basically. But you tried. You try to live peaceably with all. It takes time to learn how to forgive in this way. And there are some hurts and some that are so deep in this life that we cannot find in ourselves. We ask God for help to forgive and it still doesn't happen. If you ever find yourself dealing with such a deep hurt like that, it doesn't make you a lesser person. But I think we can still pray that God will have mercy on that person, even if we cannot find in our hearts to forgive. It's important to remember that. And so in the sixth commandment, you shall not murder, may we all hear God's own protest against our acts of inhumanity against each other. And we also hear in this commandment the Holy Spirit's willingness to push us back to Jesus, back to his love, his forgiveness, his grace for each of us. Because only Jesus and his love can free our hearts truly from the consuming fire of anger that we may have against another person. So, thank you for joining tonight, for reflecting with me on this sixth commandment. May we all turn again and again back to Jesus for the help that we need to live as his people, people of love, grace, mercy, and forgiveness. And as ever, please be in touch with me or with other leaders from the church. Our information is on the church website. If there is anything that I or others at Kenya Kirk can ever do for you. Thanks, everybody. God bless you all. Have a good night.